Welcome to the podcast that is always up to speed with Formula One. Mark Daly, Mark Hamilton joining you once again a little bit early this week. We're dropping this a day early, uh, Thursday, April 1st. I, I, I've got a lot of feedback from listeners that like to know what uh, the date of the podcast is that they're listening to. So a day early this week, we're, we're heading into a long weekend. Unfortunately, there is no Formula One race this weekend, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a ton of stuff to talk about. Um, I also want to credit our listeners. You know, we put out a bit of a challenge last week that we wanted to hear more. We wanted more emails. We wanted more social media interaction. And to be totally honest, you guys have come through in a big, big way. So we're going to get to some mailbag questions today as well, but lots going on. You know, we came out of uh, Bahrain last weekend. Um, things are a little bit mixed up at the top. We had Max Verstappen putting in a great performance, but not a good enough. Lewis ends up winning the race. Um, and now we've got a bit of a, a gap before Imola. And you know what, to be honest, like I looked at the calendar and for whatever reason, I just assumed it was a two week gap. And it was you that corrected me. Like for a season that is so compact and so compressed with these 23 races, it's crazy that they're making making us wait three weeks for the next race so early in the season. Yeah, as of right now, and uh, I should mention that this is our April Fool's joke, because by the time most people start listening to it, it'll be uh, April 1st, which actually kind of blows my mind that we're already like a quarter of the way through 2021. I mean, time just flew. Anyways, you're totally right, Mark. We're still 17 days away from Imola, which uh, I don't know how I'm going to last, but I, I just kind of go back and think, okay, we made it through the off season. We made it through December. We made it through January, February. We got to spring or sorry, winter testing. So I, I think even though I'm not going to be... Uh, Maybe uh, uh, I'll survive. Let's just put it that way. But uh, yeah, I mean, big shout out to, to the listeners. Uh, like you say, uh, we, we put the call to action out there and uh, responded. Uh, There's a big response uh, on Twitter, on the email, and got some great messages uh, from, from people. Uh, first one uh, I, I wanted to talk about uh, was just uh, quickly was uh, we had an email a couple of days ago from uh, Ben Nylon. And uh, he's a Gen uh, DTS, uh, as, as so many people seem to be the, these days, it absolutely blew, um, blows my mind. Um, we, we talked about his email partially the in the race recap uh, we did the other day, but sounds like Ben's a big uh, Checo Perez fan. And uh, he was asking, uh, he says, do you know where you can get Perez merchandise? He said he checked the F1 store and the store seems out of date. And, you know, to me, that seems absolutely par for the course when it comes to the Formula One store. It seems, you know, if you want all like Mercedes or Ferrari or whatever, they're going to have all that. Everything else is a little bit hit and miss. And you just know that it's all going to be horribly, horribly expensive. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry, can't help you on that. I actually checked uh, Checo's website, but uh, he didn't have any uh, link to any, uh, you know, fan gear there. But, that, I mean, that's frustrating, right? I mean, I can go down to the mall right now and get a Lakers cap or a Yankees cap or any, like, North American sports team I can think of. And, uh, you know, or I can go and order it on Amazon. I can have it here tomorrow morning. But, you know, if I want to buy like a ball cap, you know, like the one that you're wearing, the Mercedes one, or I'd love to get one of those Aston Martin ones. I know I'm probably going to be paying 50, 60 bucks for it. Plus, you know, almost the, the, the same again in, in, in shipping and all import duties and stuff like that. And then to me, I mean, you know, you're winning all these fans. You get all these Gen DTSers, you know, checking in the sport. They want to rep their favorite driver, their favorite team. And the, the, the merch just is not out there. And uh, that just, uh, I, you know, it bugs me because, uh, you know, there, there's a huge market for it, especially here in North America. I mean, you can go outside right now and you're going to see somebody wearing a jersey, a cap, a t-shirt, whatever. And, uh, you know, that's something that they got uh, got to address, in my opinion, anyways. Yeah. And I'll just add on that as well. For, for those of you that are new, um, teams obviously revamp their team merchandise every year. Um, yeah. it's, it's a bit of a cash cow for them when you consider how much it costs to create apparel. But typically what they'll do is they'll do variations of their team merch that are driver specific. So you'll have a cap with the number of the driver on and Hamilton has six or seven or eight special edition caps every single year. And you'll have the Daniel Ricardo merch, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's interesting because Red Bull has dropped their, uh, I was going to say FY21, but this isn't a financial news podcast. Uh, they've dropped their calendar 2021 merch on the Red Bull Racing website. It looks pretty good. It's not a lot different than what we've seen in any prior year, but there's nothing driver specific. And, and I'd assumed at one point that maybe this was simply because Sergio Perez joined the team so late that they weren't able to produce any merch for him. But he does actually appear on the Red Bull Racing website wearing 
generic Red Bull racing merchandise. So whether they're not planning to release any or it's coming later, I don't know. Um, I'll put out some feelers and, and try to get a sense, but it would be a little bit odd if Red Bull didn't try to cash in on the popularity of Sergio Perez globally, and especially when we go to Mexico later this season. But yeah, interesting that there is no Sergio specific merchandise at this time, uh, but there is Max specific merchandise. So interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there would obviously be uh, Max Verstappen, uh, you know, uh, merchandise out there. But you think, I mean, uh, Checo, I mean, you know, you have to think, especially in the States, uh, that there's going to be lots of Mexican fans that want oh, to totally. you know, represent. I mean, uh, you know, I, a good buddy of mine is Mexican. And he just uh, always uh, tells me that when we're, when we're talking about like soccer, how that, you know, that, that is such a huge untapped market when it comes to or demographic in the United States. So anyways, uh, we will definitely keep uh, keep an eye on that. And uh, the second email we had is uh, from JJ checking in from Houston, Texas and repping the, uh, the, the Lone Star City. town I'd love to go to Texas sometime. And uh, you oh, know, Texas is yeah. awesome. Man. I want to go to so bad. Is, dude, I so, so, so good. So I, I haven't been a, a ton, but every time I've been there that the people are great, the food is fantastic. All the stereotypes about stereotypes about barbecue are big. It's just, every city is just sprawl and strip malls and mansions. Like for whatever reason, I loved it. Like I could actually totally see myself living in Metro Dallas or Austin or San Antonio, um, or even kind of, I would say Metro Houston, like it's very, very, very cool. Now I've typically gone during the fall when the edge is off the heat a little bit. So I haven't mm -hmm. had to be there in the middle of the summer where it gets super humid in uh, Houston, but Texas is, is awesome, man. Super, super, super great. And Austin's this fantastic, progressive, um, incredibly fast growing city. Texas is very, very cool. Man. It's not the Texas of old. It's kind of this, this old kind of Texas independent Republican culture, but with this infusion of new blood and money and immigration and business and technology, it's very cool. So yeah. I, sh I shouldn't have ranted so much, but it's a cool place. <laughs> well, it's cool because, uh, you know, that that actually, you know, we're, we're talking about places we want to go and, uh, and JJ, you know, not surprisingly, he's a Gen DTS said uh, he got introduced to the sport uh, through Netflix and through a colleague of his at, uh, at grad school. So he's been hardcore into it for the past couple of years, loves the show and, uh, you know, that, which is awesome. You know, I really appreciate you uh, listening to us each and every week. And, you know, JJ goes on to say, he, he's asking, he said, when it's safe to travel again, what race on the calendar do you recommend seeing live in person and why? So, I mean, I've only been, the, the two races I've been to have been uh, uh, at the Nürburgring in Germany, which is a fantastic venue, but it's a little bit hard to get to, middle in the, the, the Eiffel Mountains there, but it's it's absolutely stunning place to go. You know, if there's a, a Grand Prix there, definitely worth uh, checking out. And I've been to Barcelona, and Barcelona is worth going to just for the fact that it's Barcelona. It is an absolutely amazing, wonderful, cultural city of so many marvelous things to do. But then I was thinking, if, if, if I could go anywhere right now, uh, you know, for, for any race right now, I could jump in a plane and go to. First one, I go to Japan. Love to go to the Japanese Grand Prix because I've had this weird obsession with J Japan and Japanese culture and Japanese history ever since I was a kid. I've been to Japan. I love the country, love the people and everything there. So that's on my list. Number two. And I think this has got to be an absolute uh, F1 bucket list item would be Monza, Italian Grand Prix. Mm. You, you know, I mean, it's be a little bit hit and miss, uh, you know, wh whether or not uh, Ferrari's got a, a chance to win that race. But definitely that would be, that would be my, I, I probably go right now with Monza as, as my top, you know, just to, to soak up the atmosphere, watching uh, Ferrari race at home in front of the Tifosi, you know, at, at a classic uh, racetrack. So that, that would be my pick. How about you, Mark? Yeah, you know, I, I got to say that, this listener, and thank you so much for the email, man, is is in a really unique position because unlike so many of our listeners, he actually lives relatively close to a race, right? Like yeah. the Circuit of the Americas, which is in Southwest Austin, so outside the city limits, is a two hour and 20 minute, two hour and 30 minute drive from the center of Houston, Texas. So depending on where he is, it's a two, two and a half hour drive. Like that, that's almost possible as a day trip. But I think my recommendation would be the Circuit of the Americas is a fantastic track. Um, there's great vantage points. The grandstands are great. The food's good. Culture wise, it's not necessarily going to be a lot different than what you're used to going to a sporting event in in texas especially if you've been to motorsports before it's but going backyard right totally i just i think it's a good place to start get the three-day get the four-week four-day pass go on the friday 
go to the track, experience both the practice sessions, um, go on the Saturday, go to see practice, see qualifying, and then see the race on the Saturday, just because it's so close and it's so accessible. Um, but my sense is I would recommend um, the British Grand Prix. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. Silverstone's fantastic. You could create a much bigger trip out of it if you wanted to see London or Birmingham and all the kind of the really fun touristy stuff associated with that country. And it's also accessible because really it's only an eight, nine hour flight um, from Houston. Plus, again, the language is familiar. It's, it's, it's accessible. But I think the other option too, and, and I, I, I've never thought about going, but I have a lot of friends that are dying to go to the Mexican Grand Prix. Mm -hmm. um, just from a, a culture perspective and from an atmosphere perspective, you can see it in that attract how serious the Mexican fans are about the events and, and how, how passionate they are about the sport, especially when Sergio is there. But I think start with Circuit of the Americas. It's a two and a half hour drive. Um, and then I would say the British Grand Prix is a great place to start simply because it's not super far away. Um, the language is familiar to you and you shouldn't not go to a race because of the language, but it's a good immersion for your first, for your first kind of, uh, experience. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd give an honorable uh, mention to the British Grand Prix. I only didn't pick it because, you know, I'm half English. I've been to England a million, million times. So, you know, there, there's a lot of familiarity there. So I, I tend to pick uh, places that are a little bit more, well, I mean, if you've never been to the UK before, it might seem exotic and things like that. But, you know, like I say, Japan, I've always had a fascination with, and I think Monza is an absolute uh, bucket list uh, item. Totally. Anyways, guys, thanks so much uh, for checking in on the uh, the emails. And uh, there's there's tons of tweets, so many tweets. Uh, I don't think we can get a chance to, to, to get to them all right now. Maybe we'll come back to them a little bit later. But I wanted to start getting into some of the latest news here. And I thought this was interesting because a year ago, this wouldn't have even been a conversation. Now, th this will, I guess, be proven in the weeks and months ahead whether or not this actually becomes a thing. But uh, Lewis was saying in the wake of his win at Bahrain last uh, weekend that uh, he felt it was an opportunity to prove people wrong and basically said that, uh, you know, he's um, maybe not getting all the respect that he's due, that, um, that, that he won all those championships due to the fact that he's a really good uh, driver, not because he had the best, <laughs> best car. I mean, for me, Lewis, absolutely the right guy in the right place at the right time. I don't think uh, that, that there's any other way to, to, to put it. I think he was the best uh, guy or the best driver going to the best team with the best car. And it was just kind of like the stars aligning. And, and let's not just uh, remember, I mean, you know, you, you just don't automatically win races just by showing up each and every weekend. He's had to put the work in each and every practice session, each and every qualifying session, each and every race. I mean, he's had the benefit of having the best car with the best engine in Formula One for years. So, I mean, he's had a massive, massive advantage. I mean, we've seen him push to, from, from time to time. It hasn't been you know, super easy, like all, all the time for him. I mean, 2016, 2015, I mean, he had Nico Rosberg, you know, nipping at his heels there. I mean, Nico won races, he won a championship and all of that. And then you go into 2017, 2018, you know, the Ferrari was more dom. Well, I wouldn't say dominant. They were more competitive then. You know, Vettel, uh, especially through the first two thirds of 2018 was, uh, we, it was definitely in the, the, the championship uh, conversation, but Certainly 2019, 2020, it's, it's, it's been pretty much his own, you know, his, his own way. He hasn't really been uh, challenged uh, too often. And uh, the, the races that, uh, you know, where Valtteri has been the better of the two Mercedes drivers have really been far and few between. So, you know, I, I agree with Lewis. I, I think that uh, just uh, by saying that, you know, he's just had the best car and it all comes down to the machinery. I, I think that's, a, uh, I don't like that comment. I, I don't think that, uh, you know, that that's a real accurate take let's put it that way yeah I, I think I'm pretty much done with this with the Lewis Hamilton is he the greatest of all time conversation I, I think for me when, when I reflect back on his career and I think one of the things that a lot of the newer viewers may not be familiar with is that there was a Lewis Hamilton uh, career before there was a Lewis Hamilton Mercedes career, right? I think yeah, so many of the yeah. folks that, that are new to Formula One or that have started following since 2014 only know Lewis with Mercedes and they only know Lewis as this dominant driver with this dominant team and a, a tom dominant infrastructure around him. But this is a guy that won 22 races and a world championship before he ever migrated to Mercedes, right? Like he, he, he was a point away from the championship in 07 and just lost it to Kimi Raikkonen. He mm -hmm. wins the championship in 08 and that was a phenomenal finish. Like he had to fight to the very end to win that championship. And he continued to win races, even when McLaren weren't particularly competitive in that kind of 09 to 13 period. Heck, he won a race and I'll never forget this. He won a race at Austin in 
2012 that Mercedes had no business even being competitive in, right? Like this is a guy that has demonstrated that he's a quality driver. No, I, the, the, the problem is for him and his legacy is he just happened to be in the best car in the world at the most kind of, I would say opportune time. Um, but I, yeah, absolutely. I just, I don't think that should necessarily take away from his legacy. Like he was in the best car. Great. And he won every single title except for 2014 when he came a close second. Like, okay, so he does have the greatest car, and I don't think anyone would dispute that, and I don't think he would dispute that either. But what else was he supposed to do with that car? Did he leave points on the table? No. Did he lose championships? No. He's done everything possible with the equipment given to him. And for him, I can't fault that. And then, again, if you just look at his reliability and his consistency, he doesn't make mistakes. Um, he He's extremely reliable. I, I just... I, I think the criticism's undue, and I, I generally agree with them. Now, this year is going to be a whole different conversation because I think the car is going to be less competitive than it was the prior few years. And yeah, it'll be interesting. But I think I'm done with this conversation, but it'll be interesting to see how the narrative plays out this year. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to pick up on that on the other side of the break here because uh, three-time world champion Nelson Piquet had to, to weigh in on that. And it wasn't what? so much, yeah, not so much the fact that uh, that Lewis has maybe been the beneficiary of uh, of having the, the, the best car and it was all down to the machinery. But he basically uh, said, you know, made the comparison of what would happen between a battle of uh, a teammates of uh, Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton, which I think is a more interesting conversation. You get two awesome drivers in the same machinery who comes out on top. We'll talk about that in just a moment after we take our first break. So don't go away. All right. Well, welcome back to the show. We're talking Formula One. We're talking specifically about uh, Lewis Hamilton. And Mark, just uh, before the break there, I hinted at uh, this uh, quote that came out uh, earlier this week from three-time uh, world champion Nelson Piquet. And uh, he was uh, talking specifically um, about uh, you know uh, Lewis Hamilton and uh, Max Verstappen. Now, I think this would qualify as a hot take uh, because uh, Nelson oh, yeah. was saying that uh, Max would smash. And those are the words he used. He used smash. Lewis, uh, if they were partnered together at uh, at Mercedes, and that's one you know thing I've said before is, and maybe not to the the comparison between Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen. I think it was more after I think uh, Lewis won his uh, seventh uh, title, or maybe it was a six. I can't remember, but uh, you know it's hard to compare Lewis to Schumacher and yeah. to Senna and to you know even Nelson Piquet. You know all these world champions of past because you know they're all different drivers in different eras and the formula has been completely different and the you know the technology's been different i mean the one thing that uh, that we can all agree on you know Fangio was the greatest of his day Senna was the greatest in his day Schumacher and and so on and so on and so on i mean the, the only way we'll ever find out is one of these days when we're floating up there on on a cloud you know twanging away on a harp or something like that <laughs> <laughs> all these guys will get into the same car and have some you know race around and uh, you know whatever comes after you know whatever this existence right now is i mean that's why you know it, it's kind of hard to make that uh, the, that that comparison to get you know especially between generations of drivers now where i think this conversation gets interesting is when uh, you know uh, pk says you know if, if you put max and lewis in the same car he says i'm sure he would smash hamilton end quote and i i think that is uh, that is interesting i mean i don't think that there's any doubt that in some of these uh, you know past couple of years it's not even a conversation. The Mercedes is better than the, than the Red Bull, and the Red Bull has been completely driven off its uh, four wheels by Max. He's driven it beyond the edge of the envelope, pushed it to beyond its uh, its capabilities. And I, I don't think that 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 I don't think that's open for discussion at the moment. I think that's been uh, pr proven um, uh, without a doubt. But you know, it would be interesting. I, I mean, I don't think we'll ever see it happen. But it would be interesting to see how these two would line up in the same uh, car. It, it, it just, uh, it's one of those things that you start thinking about it, you just can't let it go. Just, just a comment on that Max Verstappen piece. I, I think I'm probably the last person in the entire F1 universe to come to that realization about Max Verstappen. I, I've, I've always like, yeah, he's good and he's in a great car. It's only been recently that I've started to come to the realization that He's not just a good driver. He's a transcendent talent mm -hmm. that is absolutely, to your point, driving that car beyond its limits. And that's pure talent. Um, and I, I think I'm probably the last person in the world to give him credit for that. But to your other point, too, I think it, it's obviously really difficult to compare generations for so many reasons. And, you know, I, I'm a big basketball fan. And, and the basketball that's being played today at the NBA level is 
fundamentally a different sport than it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Absolutely. That the way they yeah. play the game, the way they space the, 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 the floor, the, the fact that it's positionless now, that, that everyone's is all about that, the three point game, like it's a different sport. And you hear these old timers from 20 or 30 years ago, like the Charles Barkley's and the Michael Jordan's that they interject, like, well, if, if these guys couldn't have played in our league, but you couldn't have played in their league because it's a different sport. Your conditioning was terrible. You smoked at halftime. You're <laughs> drinking beers in the locker room. These guys are absolutely pure athletic specimens. Like they are a whole different breed of athlete than, than you were, whether it's a Steve Nash or whatever the case might be. Like it's a, it's a whole different world than when you played, but likewise, it's the same for formula one, right? Like the, the sheer fitness of these drivers, like a, a Lewis Hamilton or a Max Verstappen or whoever the case is that these cars are so much more powerful and the G forces are so much greater than the cars of 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, that they're forced to elevate their level of fitness to a, a place that James Hunt could never even have imagined. I don't think that James Hunt could have finished one lap in a modern F1 car without <laughs> having a borderline seizure because those drivers back then didn't have to be conditioned in the same way they are today. Now no. that said, that racing back then was a different different sport as well. It was incredibly dangerous. It had none of the safety precautions that we have today. They weren't driving in fireproof suits. They had no runoff area on the tracks. So mentally, psychologically, it was different. So I don't think you can compare these generations. And like you said, the only way you could is when we're up in heaven with our harp next to us and we can kind of pull everyone together and say, hey, equal cars, same track. You get two weeks to warm up. Let's see what you can do. Like, Yeah, exactly. Anyways. You know, it, it really is interesting. I mean, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, we were chatting about it on WhatsApp there last week, and then I've, I've gone into the archives at F1 TV, and I've started watching the 2009 championship again because, you know, that, that season fascinated me. You know, just the way that Braun GP, you know, the forerunner to uh, Mercedes, came out and completely caught everybody off uh, off guard. So I went and watched the Australian Grand Prix. And I mean, obviously the cars are, are vastly different, and you, you see a lot of guys that uh, that are still around today. You got a mid career Kimi Raikkonen and Fernando Alonso. You've got a young Lewis Hamilton. I mean, there, there's a lot of familiar names that are that are in the sport then that are still in the sport now or only recently retired. Anything. The one thing that I found interesting is, uh, you know, you go back to that era and it was also you had, uh, you know, the, the pit stops, let's just say they look sloppy, but, you know, you go back to that era, you didn't need to change all four tires in two seconds because, you know, you're putting in 12 seconds worth of fuel into the car. Right point. So, you know, it, it looks really, really funny and chaotic and everything like that. And you see, you know, the drivers coming in for their, their, their pit stops and the commentators are going mad, you know, oh, there's a great stop. And you think that, well, yeah, you know, Max at, uh, at Bahrain last weekend, they needed to come up and, and really have a sharp pit stop. And they got him out on that last pit stop in 1.9 seconds. You know, it's, yeah. it's absolutely crazy. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, like you say, I mean, the sport is fundamentally different. But going back to my, my original, um, I guess the crux of the, the, the whole conversation is to, you know, put them in the same car. And uh, until you see Max V. Lewis in the same machinery, it just becomes one of these theoretical... Uh, you know, teasers, I guess, I guess you could say, because in, in, until they line up as teammates, we're just never going to know for sure. Yeah, totally agree. All right. Well, moving on to the the, the next one. Uh, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, current world champion and, uh, you know, a potential, you know, a champion to be. And talking about a four-time world champion, Sebastian Vettel, uh, Gerhard Berger, former for Formula One uh, driver. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's worried about uh, Sebastian. He says that uh, Seb is not good at handling the pressure in F1. And um, Gerhard had the following to say, quote, Sebastian is a four-time world champion. So he's uh, one of the outstanding drivers, no question. But he never reacted well under pressure. Remember when Daniel Ricciardo came to Red Bull, he was very strong and put pressure on Sebastian. For Sebastian, it was difficult to cope with. In Ferrari, it was the same thing. I just feel when you watch him, you feel he's not free. He's not relaxed enough. He's just trying to prove things that at this moment are impossible because the car isn't good enough or his own form isn't good enough. When you're in that situation, you need to sit down, take a step back and say, well, take it easy and success is going to come again. In saying that, he's at the end of his career too. When you've done so many races, when you're already a four-time world champion, then comes a point when maybe you're not in a situation when you like to take all the risks where you like to fight uh, when you would like to fight uh, before you've won any races. In some way, it just doesn't work out well for him. He starts to make mistakes and people start to question him. 
that's just step by step more pressure. And as I said at the beginning, he doesn't like pressure. End quote. So it, yeah, I you know, I can't disagree with that statement. I think that's uh, you know a, a pretty good uh, you know a summary of it. And then you know you hear another former world uh, champion, uh, Damon Hill, won the the championship in 1996. He feels, and his uh, you know his direct quote is uh, he feels that um, that uh, Sebastian's getting beaten to a pulp like a pinata. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, Gerhard being a little bit more uh, diplomatic, but uh, Damon certainly getting right to the heart of the matter. Yeah, easy to pile on. You know, yeah, I yeah, I don't sure. know that I I necessarily, and I didn't mean you by the way. I meant the the media and the analysts piling on to to <laughs> uh, to Sebastian Vettel. I think we're much more generous and a lot more fair. I, I think my consideration here is. I think the big concern that I think a lot of people have is Sebastian showed a whole bunch of symptoms last year. And I think we were all willing to write them off in the off season because it was an awkward year at Ferrari. They've been penalized by the FIA. There was some friction with Charles Leclerc. I think we were all kind of willing to overlook last year. The problem is that through winter testing in the first race weekend, all of those symptoms are still present. You know what I mean? Like it's, it seems problematic. Now, that said, I'm worried, and, and I don't know what the issue is. I don't know if it's psychological. It could just be the car. It could just be a lack of familiarity with the car because we had a short winter testing, and he gets to Imola, and he looks much more competitive. And then by the time we get to Canada, he's competing for podiums. We could see that. I think that comment, though, about Vettel not being good under pressure is total, total garbage. And, you know, I went back and I looked at this a little bit earlier. So, obviously, we know the, we know the arc of... Sebastian Vettel's career. He won a race at Toro Rosso in Italy. Fantastic. He goes to Red Bull. In 2010, in 2010, he won the championship with 256 points. His teammate, Mark Weber, finished third at 242. He beat Fernando Alonso by just four points. So, you know, if this is a guy that's not good under pressure, but he squeaks out a championship by four points. I don't know if that's necessarily, I don't know if that's necessarily compatible, that statement. You look at 2011, 2011 was slightly different. He dominates the championship. He wins by with 392 points. He crushes Mark Weber, who scored only 258 points. Now you go into 2012. 2012 was razor thin again. And again, Sebastian wins the, wins the title. He scores 281 points. Fernando Alonso, just like in 2010, finishes second with 278 points. So he won two titles by a combined margin of seven points over two-time world championship champion Fernando Alonso, right? Like this is a guy that's demonstrated that he can win and, and race under pressure. And in 2010, he won the last race. He basically had to win the last race to win that championship. And he did that. So I think he's demonstrated that he can race under pressure. What we've seen the last couple of years, I don't know. There's something yeah. fundamentally flawed ever since probably mid 2019. And there were some mistakes in 2018, but some things started going haywire in 2019. Last year was a disaster. I think we would all admit that. But I think the problem and the concern is that so many of those symptoms that we saw last year are still present now. And that's what's troubling me. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting, too. I mean, the, the, just to give a little bit more context to, to what Damon was saying, was he feels that it's awful to watch uh, Seb getting beaten to a pulp. So, I mean, he, he obviously feels and he yeah. recognizes, you know, the, the situation he's in. I mean, to me, I, I mean, this is something that's obviously not quantifiable, but uh, I mean, to me, it seems like a guy that, uh, for lack of a better term, he's lost his mojo. I mean, it just seems yeah. everything that's that's going wrong. I mean, you know, getting, you know, not getting out of Q1 because, you know, the, those, uh, you know, those two w periods of uh, waved yellow flags and qualify and then getting the penalty on top of it. And then, you know, I, I think that, you know, that, that's got to sit funny with you. And then, you know, starting from the back of the grid, I mean, he came out and owned that, uh, that mistake that he made uh, during the race where he uh, drove up the backside of uh, Esteban Alca into turn one there. I mean, that was avoidable. I mean, you know, he just, um, you know, he just misjudged that. I mean, that was just yeah. uh, one of those yeah. things. But uh, unfortunately, it just, you know, when, when you're already having, you know, those sorts of issues, it just, you know, it, it just seems to, you know, I guess the old saying is it never rains, but, uh, but it pours, I, you know, and I, I just can't help but feeling that that if things start to go well for him, if things start to, you know, gets a little bit consistency, I think we'll see improvement. I mean, yeah. there, there, there's I, where I do agree with Gerhard is the fact that all athletes, they, their their performance does de decrease over time. I mean, Sebastian's only turning 34. You would think that he still has some very good years left in him in Formula One. I mean, but ultimately it is a race against uh, time. But the other thing that I find, you know, a little less, um, 
I'm not even sure how to put this. So just the, sort of the mental side that, you know, like you say, he won two championships by, you know, like a combined seven points in those two seasons. So, I, I mean, I don't think that that's something, I think that's something you either have in you or you don't in your, in your psychological makeup and, you know, barring some huge psychologically devastating event, I, I would find that a little bit difficult to, uh, you know, to, to, you know, uh, that that would just disappear from somebody. I mean, I, I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I don't understand those things, but it just seems to me that's just like one of those core characteristics you either have or you don't have. I, you know, I, I think obviously he's been, you know, the, the victim of some very unfortunate circumstances, some of it his own fault, some of it is, uh, you know, not of his own making. And sometimes it was a combination. I mean, let, let's face it, some of the things that happened to him at, uh, at Ferrari what was a combination because, I mean, Ferrari... Um, aren't really the greatest tacticians or strategists and they sometimes you know, put their drivers in, in awkward, uh, you know, uh, positions. I mean, you'll go back to last weekend. I mean, not only was it, was it a, a battle between Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton on the track, it was also a battle of the minds on the pit wall. I mean, you kind of look at the strategy and the tactics that both Mercedes and Red Bull employed, you know, kind of, you know, you, you could give advantage to either one of those teams, uh, you know, throughout the race. And then I think ultimately you give a bit of an edge to, to, to Mercedes. So the thing is, you know, when, when Sebastian was at Ferrari, I mean, that wasn't always the case. And uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, some of the situations that he, he, he was in that, uh, you know, he was forced to push himself and sometimes it didn't really work out uh, that well, but you know, I, I think basically when it comes down to it, I, I would share the concern that people have, but, you know, I, I just can't help shake the feeling that, you know, if he starts getting some some decent results that he'll build on that. And and ultimately where he yeah. takes him, I don't know, but I, I'm not ready to write, write Sebastian Vettel off just yet. I mean, let, let's just put it that way. And I, I, I'll add one thing as well. I, I think Sebastian's got to stop making it so difficult on himself in terms of yes. the qualifying piece. Like if you're going to qualify... P15, P20, you're going to make your life that much more difficult because to be competitive, you have to cut your way through the field of 15 drivers to put yourself in a position to get a podium. And if you're spending that much time battling other cars, there's a much greater likelihood that there's going to be incidents like there yeah. were on Sunday with, with Esteban Ocon. Like you, you, and this was, I think, the criticism of uh, Lance Stroll so much in his early seasons was, you know, he had great race pace and he demonstrated great race craft. He's, he's a little bit reactive as a driver instead of a really strategic, smooth driver, but he would always make life so difficult because he qualified so poorly. So I think one of the things that Sebastian Vettel has to solve is he's got to start qualifying better. So he's not at the back of the field competing with the Alfa Romeos and with the Renaults and, and with some of those other kind of lower pack cars. Like he just needs to qualify better build some confidence going into race day and not get caught up at the back of the field where there's going to potentially be contact and incidents and things like that, that could derail his race. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're starting that far back, I mean, realistically, you're only looking at maybe uh, one of the lower point pain uh, positions and, and unless there's some bizarre circumstances or there's rain or multiple safety cars and things yeah. like that. I mean, you really throw yourself rather uh, on chance rather than a, a solid, uh, you know, race strategy and, and a good qualifying position that sets you up nicely to challenge for a podium or for a race win. I mean, if you're putting yourself, you know, three quarters of the way down through the, through, down the grid, I mean, it, it's, it's realistically a podium is just as an on. I mean, and, you know, I mean, we see it from time to time. I mean, you look at Sergio Perez at Bahrain last year, he came all the way from the back to win that race. But I mean, the, those performances really are far and few between, but anyways, Mark, uh, time for another break here. And when we come back, I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, Valtteri Bottas, because I think there, there might be some, some cracks showing in, uh, in his relationship uh, with uh, Mercedes. And we'll talk about that in uh, just a moment. So guys, don't go away. We'll be right back. All right. Well, welcome back to the show. And we're going to talk a little bit now about uh, Mercedes and, uh, and Valtteri Bottas because he was uh, complaining after the the, the race that, uh, you know, he felt that uh, the strategy that they had for him that was a little bit uh, too uh, defensive. And, uh, you know, he said he was disappointed. He said it was good that the team scored points. And he said that uh, strategy-wise, he felt that the team was uh, defensive instead of like their, their normal attacking uh, selves. And, well, I mean, they, they did have a disastrous pit stop. I don't know what it is with that track and, and, and bad pit stops uh, from uh, Mercedes, especially in the last couple of races that, that uh, we, we've seen there. 
Um, and Total Wolf kind of uh, countered that. Uh, he said that he didn't think that there was any strategy on on, on the table. And uh, he he said uh, you know, they also tried to the the undercut with Valtteri, and he thought that that would help with the race. Uh, but you know, I, I, it'd be kind of comments you kind of expect uh, from from both of them. I mean, they're kind of generic kind of uh, comments uh, from from Total Wolf. But I just find it a little bit interesting that they're kind of disagreeing with each other in public through the media. So, you know, I, I think that maybe perhaps uh, you know, Valtteri, of course really isn't an outspoken very uh, very often and uh, th this isn't really an inflammatory you know comment uh, by by any means but I just I just find it interesting the way that uh, you know the, it's just sort of being thrown out there and the reaction from from wolf comes in the in the media so who knows what's going on behind closed doors but I I do find it interesting mark well, I think he understands, and I think we all appreciate that this is his last year at Mercedes. And I would put, and I'm a terrible gambler, which is why I don't do it, but I would put money <laughs> on the fact that he's not going to be back next year. And he probably understands it. And I think he's also looking to build a resume to enable him to secure a ride for next year. And I think he, he's probably going to take things a little bit more personally. And he's probably going to approach the races a little bit different, knowing that, hey, if I want to have a ride next year, which isn't a guarantee because there's so many great young racers in the sport um, that he needs to, to build build on some of the successes that he's had in previous years. And it's funny, man, when you started talking about uh, Valtteri Bottas, to me, there's no more boring subject in Formula One than Valtteri <laughs> Bottas. And I mean that with all due respect, he's a nice guy. He's a great family guy. He's just so boring. His racing is so boring. His media comments are so boring that I didn't want to get into this. But as soon as you said, oh, there might be a crack in that relationship, like, like, go on. This sounds like some ParisHilton.com stuff. But but you're right. Like, I, I think we'll probably see more and more of it as the season goes on. And I think one of the biggest challenges that Toto is going to have this year, particularly if the team isn't running away with the Constructors Championship and the Driver Championship, is, is how does he... How does he keep that team together? Like, ultimately, nobody's going and interviewing the engineers and the mechanics. So if they're angry or upset or disengaged, you don't know. But people interview the drivers every single day. So you need to keep your – respectfully, you've got to keep your thumb on them and just make sure that they're projecting the same consistent message. But I think that's difficult to do when they're going to be out of contract and they have their own personal ambitions and motivations. But it's going to be really interesting to see what happens this year, especially, especially if they're not running away with the constructors championship and i think we've talked about this before right where if if you are if you're running a, a dynasty as a team a lot of the drama that happens inside the locker room isn't as relevant but it becomes more relevant if the team's not performing at the same level right like i think sometimes we tolerate things within organizations that maybe we wouldn't if you weren't performing and maybe that's what's going to happen this year so it'll be a it'll be interesting to see yeah well that, that kind of leads in nicely to uh to, to my reply to that because um, i was just sort of thinking that um, you know i know i know they won the first race i know that they got uh, two cars up there on the podium and, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, they did what they needed to do. Right. And yeah, totally. the thing, the thing is that it looks good from the point of uh, results. Obviously they would have liked to have a front row, front row lockout and qualify. Yeah. They would have liked to have uh, both cars come home one, two, but the thing is going through winter testing, we know that the W12 isn't as all dominating as the cars that they've had in previous years. And uh, you know they're they're saying this leads into the next story that I wanted to talk about. They 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 they're fearing that they're they're not going to have as much pace going into Imola and Portugal, which are the next two races. And I, I think that they're feeling pressure. I think that um, that you know maybe. Well, I, I mean, I guess it's a little bit too early to say whether it's better than the Red Bull. I think that uh, what we can say based on what we've seen so far through um, through winter testing through the first race is that these cars are a lot closer than they have been in the past couple of years, which is ultimately the better car will play out over the coming weeks and months ahead after we've had several races under our, our, our belt and we can tell. But what I do know, what, what I feel at this point anyways is that they're feeling the pressure because the, the car isn't where it wants to be. It doesn't seem to me that it's it's as dominant as they want it to be and to do the things right. that they want it to do. Because, I mean, as Total also always says, good isn't good enough. We're chasing perfection. I mean, I'm kind of paraphrasing there. And I, I think they're feeling the heat a little bit. So if we go to Imola in a couple of weeks' time and Max wins that one or uh, maybe he wins the next two, I mean, this is a pure speculation. This is going to be pretty much uncharted territory for Mercedes because we've seen over, especially over the past couple of years, that they race off in the first several races of the year. And by the time Ferrari or Red Bull, you know, they start getting their act together, they're almost too far down the proverbial road to, to catch up in the championship and either the drivers or the constructors. 
and it gets to that uh, you know that that sort of uh, perpetual conversation unless something drastic happens and Mercedes you know they they completely lose the plot you know this is their their championships uh, to 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 lose so let me let me ask you a question yeah, and this ahead. sorry th this just occurred to me and I, I'm kind of curious so total wolf uh, we all know total great guy. He's obviously led um, a dynasty. He, he came to this team before the, the turbo hybrid era. Um, blah, blah, blah. You can say all the great stuff in the world about Toto. He's approachable, accessible, charismatic, great guy, never puts a foot wrong. He's managed to uh, kind of manage these driver relationships, all that kind of stuff. He's in a position now where he owns and, and all the power to him. He owns a third of that Formula One team. He's got investments in interests throughout the sports um and throughout other competitive motorsports leagues if i'm lewis hamilton i was just thinking this if i'm lewis i have arguably been as much a part of the success of that team i've clearly been the face of the success of that team toto's got a long-term significant investment in that team which could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars and if I'm Lewis, you know, for sure, I've been cashing the biggest paychecks in Formula One year over year over year. But now I'm in a position where I basically have nine months of checks left. And I don't know what my future looks like beyond that. And if I'm Toto, who I've been effectively a partner with in during this journey, Toto's future secure. He's got hundreds of millions of dollars worth of shares in this team. He has tens of millions of share dollars worth of shares in other sports teams. Like, I, like I'm just thinking, like, if I'm Lewis, like, did I get my fair share out of this journey? If we were partners and they weren't technically partners, but if we were partners in this journey, I'm going to walk out of this with a paycheck and no future security. You, Mr. Toto, who's been my partner during this journey, you own a third of this team and you're worth almost a billion dollars. Like, I wonder, I, I wonder if that could potentially create friction too. And like, we talked about the fact that Mercedes doesn't owe Lewis anything, but maybe they kind of do owe him that hometown discount, right? Like, look, you were a part of seven championships. Like, you know, we're, we're just going to keep giving you that hometown discount every, or we're going to keep giving you a kind of a sweet deal every year just to recognize what you contributed. But I wonder if there's some friction there because of that too. And that's purely speculative. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that's a, you know, a fascinating kind of, uh, you know, angle to take at it. And I think it. um, uh... That's a story that morphs over time. I mean, if, yeah, if Lewis totally. had won, you know, just one championship back in 14 or 15 or 16 or whatever, or maybe two, you know, maybe that's, you know, th th there's a completely different take on that. But I mean, he's been instrumental in every one of those championships. Even in, in 16, he didn't win the drivers, but he obviously came runner up and helped, you know, win the, the, the constructors championship. So, I mean, he's been directly involved in all of them in this era of dominance. And it kind of makes you wonder, you know, if there's potential for some, you know, like you say, friction, hard feelings, what, what you know, call yeah, exactly. whatever you want to do, you know, what, whatever you want to call it, because, you know, it just wasn't one, you know, random championship or maybe two. I mean, he's been like this key, you know, central figure in this, this whole thing, because it might've been the best car, but they still needed somebody to drive it. And, you know, and, and you could take any one of those 20 drivers in there. They're all going to drive it 20 different ways. Yeah. And only Lewis has been able to drive it uh, consistently. I mean, he's been there the longest, of course, but he's uh, done the, the, you know, the, he's done the business for so many years now. And yeah, it, it just, it, it is a fascinating uh, conversation and, and topic to think about is like, do they owe him something more? Are they obligated to do something more for him right. than just a, a really sweet uh, contract or something? I mean, w without Lewis, they, they wouldn't be where they are right now. I mean, would they be in the same position if say Sebastian Vettel went there in 2014 or yeah. somebody else? Oh, who knows? We'll, we'll never know. I mean, that's, that's, you can speculate it speculate about it and think about it uh, to to your heart's content but you know that that's an alternate uh, reality and um, you know theoretical physics and you know way beyond the uh, the scope of this show but yeah I, I i don't know i don't think there's an easy answer to that one and perhaps that's you know the, the reason why he only got a one-year deal at over the off season maybe he wanted more maybe he was asking for too much maybe mercedes you know didn't want to give him what he was asking for i mean there's so many things because it, it kind of went on for such a long time and it seemed like, uh, you know, it, it sounded like it was going to happen. And it sounded, it started, it, it, to me, it drug out a lot longer than, than it really totally. needed to. And then uh, when, when it was announced, it was just kind of, huh, you know, it, it just kind of had that sort of half empty Christmas stocking yes. feel to it rather. It's like, that's not really what I was expecting them totally. to, you know, to, to announce. Like, you know, it, especially 
the way it's kind of framed on one side that, uh, you know, it, it kind of leaves us more time to kind of bridge the gap to a bigger deal for next year. And then you get Lewis Hamilton's dad, you know, Anthony comes out and he says, well, you know, Lewis can, can kind of walk away from the sport from, from any time he wants. And, you know, not only is this his dad, but is his one-time manager. And so, I, you know, I, I, I'm putting a lot of, you know, like stock into what Anthony Hamilton is saying, because I mean, he knows Lewis and knows Lewis's business so well. <laughs> I'm just like, I really don't know what to make of this whole situation. Yeah. And I think the other thing that's going to be interesting to watch is uh, what happens with that, that driver salary cap piece, right? Because yeah. I, I would have to assume that right now, if, if Lewis was effectively a free agent and there was a bidding frenzy, I still think Mercedes comes out with the biggest offer just because they have the deepest pockets. But ultimately, if there's a driver salary cap and he's unhappy with Mercedes or suddenly Mercedes isn't as competitive and suddenly the offers from all of the team are effectively the same or within a few million dollars of each other, then all of a sudden, maybe he's just like, hey, you know what? I'm just going to go to the most competitive team and this team seems to have put together a better package. But I think the only other thing, and, and I know I get criticized for being such a huge Lewis homer. And trust me, <laughs> I, I'm, crit I, I'm critical of Lewis as much as I am um celebratory of lewis but just in terms of what he's delivered for mercedes he's done every conceivable thing on the track but he's been such a great ambassador for the sport off the track as well like this is a guy who hasn't put a foot wrong um as far as marketing is concerned as far as being the face of the organization he doesn't get in trouble he doesn't make mistakes there aren't social media gaffes like he's just he's very he presents himself very very well so yeah I, i'm kind of surprised and who knows maybe there is in the back room some ongoing negotiations about a long-term deal and, a, and some interest in ownership but i just think based on the comment the comments that lewis has made over the last couple of months I, I don't feel like that's the case at all and I don't think he was satisfied with that deal I think he took it because he had to but my sense is that uh conversations aren't progressing in the direction that he would potentially like yeah here we are you know a couple of weeks ago we were saying ah, you know who knows how much of a distraction this whole thing's going to be and here we are like you know after the first race of the year totally. we dive into it into a, a really big uh, major sort of way but Let's move yeah. on. I've, I've derailed on. us enough. <laughs> it's all good. Anyways, uh, we're going to take another break here. When we come back, I just want to build on that. Uh, you know, I, I just hinted at it uh, briefly that uh, Mercedes is worried about the pace that they're going to have at the next couple of races. Whereas Red Bull says that they're really pushing hard to improve the RB16B going into Scary. Imola in a couple of weeks. So this, it's, it's on. Let's just put it that way. Anyways, we're going to talk about that in a moment. So don't go away. We're going to be right back. Okay, well, welcome back to the show, and we're going to switch gears now, literally, figuratively, metaphorically. Well, we're, we're going to change topics. That's uh, basically what it is. <laughs> and we're going to move away from, directly from uh, Mercedes. We're going to talk about their their apparent big uh, rival in the championship uh, this year, based on uh, one race of about, what was it, 57 laps or something like that. Anyways, I, I think that what Red Bull did was impressive because, I mean, when you think about it, uh, Sakir is, uh, it's, it's, it's got some, it's an interesting track. Let's just put it that way. It's got some very long, straight, fast sections. It's got some tight, twisty sections. I hate that one corner that's like, what, 130 degree bend or whatever it is. I mean, uh, and, you know, by being a gamer, I mean, I don't compare myself on any level to anybody, uh, you know, driving a Formula One car for real. But that one corner is just a nightmare. You're going down a hill and, uh, you know, it's, it's easy enough to hear like the, you know, the, the commentators talking about, you know, a hot lap around there. It's like you're on the brakes, off the brakes, let the tire, let the grip, you know, like, you know and, and the downforce do it going through this corner. But uh, it, it's a track that I wouldn't typically have expected to see Red Bull be as pacey compared to, uh, to, to Mercedes. Maybe on some of the slower tracks, maybe some of the more tight technical tracks where, you know, top end speed really isn't a, uh, you know, like a, a big factor. So I, I was impressed at the fact that, uh, that Max qualified on pole. And the, the fact that he, I mean, they, they did trade the lead, uh, you know, a couple times throughout the race, depending on, uh, you know, pit stops and, and things like that. Max at the end, obviously looking very, very racy until, you know, he blew his one opportunity to, to try and really win that race. But it really came down to it. I mean, the, the, the fact that he was less than a second uh, you know, behind Lewis when the, the checkered flag uh, was waved, I think was a very, very good indication is that uh, that this is, um, you know, has the potential, let's put it that way, that it could be a very, very close championship this year. And if it does turn out to be that way, 
it's it, it could be a real treat this year. And and I just hope that this isn't a flash in the pan. But the one thing that we do know is that that Red Bull is throwing everything, including the kitchen sink at this uh, at this season. It's Honda's last season in the sport. They're taking over that IP for next year. They're going to be building their own uh, engines. They're going to be a you know a true manufacturer in their own, in their in their own right. And um, well, I, I don't think that there's any question that they've never come into a, a season less than committed or serious about it. But I think now there, there's a renewed sense of, uh, of determination from Red Bull that, so, okay, we're coming into the season a lot better prepared than, than, than we've have been in a good number of years, perhaps ever. The gap to Mercedes is definitely closed. And I, I think that, uh, you know, for uh, lack of a better term, I think that they can sense the blood in the water. And I, I think that they're ready to, to, to go at it. And I think they're ready to attack uh, Mercedes at every opportunity that they have going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't even think it's, um, I think the best way to put it is I think there's some, not desperation, but I think there's some real urgency within that organization. And the mm -hmm. urgency is driven from the fact that it's our last year where we're officially partnered with Honda. And like you said, they're going to take over the engine IP, but right now they have all the resources pouring in from Honda to support with this project. Uh, but I think the urgency is they've effectively been building to this since 2014. Next year, when we move to the new cars, we have no idea what it's going to look like. It can be total parity. The, the driver's championship, the constructor's championship could be upside down. We have no idea what next year is going to look like. So I think Red Bull's perspective is we've been building this for seven years. Honda's out at the end of the year. This is our shot. And to your point, they're investing everything possible into this team and into this championship, whether it's resources, people, capital, they did the splashy signing to bring Sergio Perez in, in the offseason. And this is probably a segue to the next point. But I think the other thing too, is if, if you looked at the race classification after Bahrain and you hadn't watched the race, you might be a little bit disappointed, like eh, Max in second, splitting the two Mercedes. We saw that a lot. Eh, a, a Red Bull driver in fifth, but Sergio scored that fifth place finish starting from the pit lane, man. And I know, I know he qualified poorly um, and he wasn't going to start at, in the front five or on the second, in the second row or anything like that, but he finished fifth from the pit lane. Like mm -hmm. what if he'd qualified in the top five? Does he, does he bounce Bottas and you have a dual Red Bull uh, podium? Who who knows, right? Like that's, that's I, I one just, of those tantalizing things. It, it's yeah. like you walk away from that race thinking, well, what if Sergio qualified better? Totally. And in his first competitive race in this car too. So, so we're here, we are, we're making all these excuses for Sebastian Vettel. Like he only had a couple of days of winter testing. He's not familiar with the car. It's built differently, different wheelbase, different aero, blah, 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 blah. But Sergio Perez steps right into this car, which is typically criticized for being difficult to drive. It's, it's a high rate car. It has a shorter wheelbase than a lot of the other cars. It rotates more easily, which can maybe be a, a challenge for drivers if they're not used to that chassis. Like there's a lot of things that make it difficult, but ultimately he finished P5, starting from the pit lane. That That's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think he looked really, really pacey at times too. I know he had like, yeah. like you say, you, you mentioned he had those, uh, those gremlins and uh, you know, right before the start of the race that really kind of uh, derailed things. I mean, he wasn't in a great uh, position to start with. And then, you know, he, he's handed this additional, you know, challenge to deal with starting the race. And uh, I mean, it, it really makes you wonder like uh, where they could have been. And, you know, like, that's a, that's a great point that you made, you know, that that splashy signing of uh, Sergio Perez, as you so you know brilliantly put it really goes, I, I think indicates of like how serious that they are. I mean, if, as we were talking about uh, you know earlier about Lewis Hamilton being the right guy in the right place at the right time with, yeah. uh, with Mercedes, I, I think that if you're, if you're um, uh, uh, Christian Horner and everybody over at Red Bull, you're probably thinking the same thing. Okay, we've got Honda that's been building towards this for the past several years. We've got the best young driver, perhaps one of the best drivers in the sport right now. We've got a good car. Like there's all these things sort of coming together right when you want it. You know, now we've got a very good number two driver in Sergio Perez. They're obviously thinking that, you know, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen now. Like th this is, this it is has the to, window. Yeah. yeah. The window for us to, to do something and win a championship is right here at our, at, at our feet. And we got to go after it because it's not going to come easy because we know that Mercedes is having challenges and we know what happens whenever uh, Mercedes uh, has challenges, they double down, they throw everything at it. And then, you know, they come back a, a couple of weeks later at the next race and not only have they solved the issue that they had, but they're better than they were before. And, totally. you know, and, and, and that's the thing that's, that you're dealing with when, uh, you know, you're fighting a team like a, a Mercedes and they, they've sensed their opportunity. 
and they're definitely going to, to, to go after it. And, you know, more to your point uh, just now, as uh, just about uh, Sergio Perez, he, you know, he's going to have to adjust his uh, driving style. And he admits that uh, to, uh, you know, to, to get used to that and get used to the, uh, the, the car that they've uh, built. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously going to be a challenge. I mean, that we, we've talked about now for the past couple of weeks, right back to winter testing, especially for all these drivers that have, uh, you know, just come into new teams uh, this year or guys that have come into uh, the, the sport brand new. I mean, l- let's look at the difference of uh, you know, the couple of the, the um, you know, the rookie drivers that came in. Mick Schumacher had an okay debut, but on cold tires, still, you know, swapped ends. Nikita Mazepin spun out in the first corner and he had a bunch of spins out throughout uh, qualifying. Then you look at Yuki Sonoda and, and, and the Alpha Tauri. I mean, brilliant performance to score a point on his debut. So, I mean, you know, the different cars obviously suit uh, different drivers, and uh, you know, but the but the point is, is that they they all had the same amount of days to 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 be able to 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 get used to it. Some guys had more laps than others, and 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 things like that. So I mean, it's not like they all had the same number of two hundred and fifty laps or whatever it might uh, might be. But right. certainly the guys uh, that you know, going back to Vettel again, that had less time in the car, you know, and especially for these cars that have been more affected by the the the, the rule changes uh, this year, especially the low rate cars like the the Aston Martin and the and the Mercedes. That's uh, been difficult, but then, you know, like, like you were saying about uh, Perez, you know, guy coming into a team with a car that is, you know, has a reputation for being difficult to drive. I mean, just, um, you know, that, that was one of the things that uh, I think that, uh, that, that uh, Pierre Gasly was criticized for during his time that uh, he just wasn't able to adapt his style to that car. And, you know, he only lasted half a season before he was given the boot and, and, and sent uh, packing again. So, you know, uh, you know, um, Helmut Marco, he's the, the, the motorsport boss at Red Bull. He said the, the, the same thing about, uh, you know, uh, Sergio Perez, but I mean, Perez, you know, he, he's not a rookie. He's been in the sport for a long time. He's early thirties now. I mean, he's got the credentials. I mean, in theory, he's got the skills. And I think that once he gets a couple of races under his belt, I mean, we certainly saw flashes of it uh, throughout uh, the, the the Bahrain Grand Prix. And I think if, uh, you know, you're cheering for Red Bull, then, then, you know, you must just be thinking like, oh, we're so close right now. Come on, guys. We're, we're almost there. You know, it's, it, it's within, it's within, you know, within reach right now. Yeah. One other, one other comment about uh, Sergio Perez and that whole Red Bull situation right now is, as desperate and as panicked as they are to to win a championship this year, Sergio Perez is in the exact same headspace, right? This is a guy that has a one-year deal with a team that has shown that they have no tolerance for keeping a driver around on the top team for longer than they deem necessary, right? Like, he's got that one-year deal, and we saw what happened with Albon. We saw what happened with Gasly. Like, all the pressure is on Perez, so I think he's hungry. The other comment about this one as well, and I think this is pretty interesting, is this story, the whole Perez having to adjust his driving style to suit a Red Bull car, blah, 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 blah. This kind of sent me down a, a bit of a rabbit hole on the internet earlier today because my perception of Perez is that he's always been a bit of a harsh driver um, in the way he handles the car and the way mm. he corners. The, the data in the analysis actually shows that as a driver, he's not that at all. Um, if you look at the racing line he takes in corners, uh, a lot of the more competitive drivers take very, very sharp V turns in corners. So they dive into the corner, they take a really abrasive turn, and they accelerate out hard. Uh, Sergio Perez is, is a much softer driver in the corners. He usually goes wide. It's a half moon shape. He's far less abrasive on the brakes. He's much better at preserving the tires as a result because he's not being as hard on the tires going into and coming out of that corner um and then the other thing too is where a lot of drivers are really 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 harsh on softer and slower and sharper corners he's very very adept at taking a squared approach so he comes in rotates the car rotates again and and accelerates out like as a driving style he's actually a very smooth driver which i wasn't expecting to see because my perception about him has always been he's very ham-fisted hard on the car and that's not actually the case at all so my sense is he's going to be able to adapt to this car probably more readily than a than somebody who's a a harsher driver and tends to attack corners more aggressively because this is a car that under pressure is going to rotate uncontrollably um, simply because it has a shorter wheelbase than I think a lot of the other cars and it's higher rake. Um, But I think he's going to adapt well to this car. Um, And I think Mm. it's going to come much more quickly. And the the benefit to him is he's been in Formula One long enough that he's used to driving cars with shorter wheelbases. Like these longer wheelbase cars, these are really new. Like this 
expansion of the wheelbase is something we've seen really seen accelerate since 2017. He's been in the sport for a decade. He knows what cars were like in 2013, 2012, 2011, when they were much shorter, much more compact. Albon and Gasly probably never experienced anything like this because the cars are so much shorter in Formula 3 and Formula 2. And then you suddenly jump into this limousine of a Formula 1 car that tends to rotate. So I, I think he's going to adapt pretty well. I really do. Yeah, I think so too. I think that uh, he'll get uh, you know get into his groove uh, before uh, too much longer, and I think it's exciting to see where he's going to go from here. You know, certainly he's it, it, on paper this is the strongest pairing that they've had in a couple of years. You know, going back to the the Verstappen uh, Ricardo partnership uh, back to that well, they came to the end after 2018. So certainly, I think that uh, if you're like I said, if you're a Red Bull fan, you got just got to be salivating. Uh, just uh, there, there's so many good oh, yeah. things happening uh, right now. But anyways, I want to take another break here, Mark. And then when we come back, I'm going to talk now about uh, McLaren and Lando Norris because Lando is showing some impressive things uh, as well. So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. And uh, we'll be right back. So don't go away. All right. Well, welcome back to the show. Mark and Mark, Daly and Hamilton, uh, going over all the latest uh, news from the Formula One world. And uh, Andreas Seidel, the team principal at uh, McLaren, believes that Lando Norris has uh, you know, taken the step to the next level. I mean, he had uh, a really good uh, qualifying. He had a really good race. He was running as high as third at one point. And, uh, you know, Seidel just gushing with compliments and good things uh, to say about uh, Lando Norris. And, you know, Lando, I think he's starting to... I think that the potential was uh, was always there. I think it was uh, apparent right from the, you know, it was very first season with the McLaren a couple of years ago. I, I go back to the French uh, Grand Prix in, uh, in 2019, I guess it was, when, uh, you know, we had that hydraulic failure late in the race and still managed to, to hold on to get some points despite the car literally, well, I wouldn't say falling apart, but uh, definitely struggling with a car that uh, just wasn't uh, doing what it was supposed to do. And he's looked uh, pretty, uh, pretty pacey. I, I think that uh, it was a strong signing and, uh, you know, to, to bring him in when they did, because I mean, if you go back, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, you had Franz Tost, who was uh, the team principal at Alpha Tauri or Toro Rosso, as it was then, was saying, you know, he wanted to work out some sort of deal to uh, to, to bring him to uh, Toro Rosso for, uh, you know, a, a, maybe on a loan for a season, season and a half or something like that. And Zach Brown, he, he basically came out and said, no, it's not going to happen. Uh, I can understand why guys would want uh, Lando on their team, but we're planning to get him into a Formula One car as soon as possible. And uh, you know, I, I know that there's kind of like, a, you know, when, when you watch DTS that, you know, there, there's this real sort of father-son relationship uh, between Lando and, and Zach Brown and, uh, you know, or mentor and, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, mentorship. Uh, but, you know, they, they certainly get uh, on really well. And uh, certainly you can see why. Uh, you know, Zach was was so eager to bring him in, even though he was so young at the time and still so young now that, uh, you know, he, he he was obviously knew what he had in terms of, a, you know, talent and a driver to bring it in, and, you know, bring him into the sport when he did. And certainly it's it's paid back. And I think that it's just going to keep getting it better and better and better. I mean, uh, you know, the, the McLaren, I thought, looked really good. I mean, Ricardo was a little bit disappointed with uh, during the race, but turns out uh, apparently he had a little bit of floor damage with, uh, you know, had a bit of contact there with Pierre Gasly on the opening lap. You know, Gasly ended up losing his wing and dropped right back down to the back of the, the, the race order. But, uh, you know, Lando, I, I thought otherwise, I thought he was, it looked really good. I mean, of course, he was way off the pace compared to the Mercedes and, uh, and the Red Bulls. But um, I, I thought uh, where he was in the pack, I think he did tremendously well. Yeah, he is, as a driver, and, you know, I spoke pretty glowingly of him, about him last week, is he's developing much more quickly than I anticipated that he would. And I think it's probably a combination of the fact that the development of that car has moved along much more swiftly um, over the past couple of years than I think a lot of us thought it would. But I, I also just think that the culture... Uh, within that organization has proved improved by leaps and bounds since the departure of Fernando Alonso. And I, I just think the pairing of Carlos Sainz and, and Nando was, was, was right to, it was, it was the appropriate relationship to nurture his early development. Um, I also just think he has a great personality. He's accessible on social media. Like there, there's so many great things about him as a young driver in the sport. He's attractive to, to young fans. Um, he's attractive to traditional F1 fans because he says the right things and he does the right thing and he's extremely competitive on track. And you're right, like with the exception of the Mercedes and the Red Bull of Max Verstappen on Sunday, um, he was arguably the best car on the track. And one of the things that I think I, I'm most impressed about him is just 
the infrequency with which he makes mistakes. Like, you know, if you look back at last year's championship, uh, we look here, he had one retirement last year. Like that, that's pretty fantastic for a driver. That's really only in his second year. Like that shows consistency and it shows maturity. Um, and, and what's even more remarkable about that is he was finishing consistently and reliably while fighting for points, right? Like this isn't, you know what, cashing in on 17th place finishes throughout the season. Like he was in the mix every single race weekend. And ever since he scored that podium to begin the season last year in in Austria, I think his trajectory um, in terms of his ceiling has just been sky high. I have nothing but great stuff to say about him. You know, it's interesting that you should mention that uh, that podium that he won in, um, in, in Austria. And I think that that was one of those moments that was so brilliantly captured in uh, Drive to Survive. Totally. Because, you know, like, I admit that, you know, I, I felt the emotion when I when I watched that episode. And, you know, you, you hear the reaction of Lando in the car. I mean, it was so real, you know. And, and you know, I, I, I felt it. I experienced it, uh, you know, real time, like as if it had just happened. And I wasn't basically watching a recap of something that had happened in July 2020. It was it was very very well done. It was just it was one of those moments as uh, you know you just couldn't help feel happy for him because you know it just uh, like you say I mean he, he's a good driver and he's a good guy and he's one of those uh, you know people you want to see succeed in in Formula One. So you can see why you know that uh, that they're going to continue to say uh, you know good things about him. But you know it's interesting to hear from you know basically his boss and you know, the team principal and uh, Andrea Seidel that uh, he feels that, uh, you know, he, he's going to the next level. And, uh, you know, th- that's why, it, you know, that I think that McLaren is one of these stories that you really want to, you know, to, to follow this year, you know, because there, there's so many interesting subplots in there. You've got Ricardo there, you've got the the, the, the Mercedes power, and then one of them, of course, these, these sort of subplots is Lando Norris. Like, how is he going to continue to develop? And, you know, here we are one race into the season, and it seems like that uh, that that story is uh, you know kind of developing you know in, in, as much as it's going to in in one uh, race weekend. But it seems that uh, you know we're starting. To, it's going where you might expect it to go, and and it is at uh, you know at the age that he's at right now, you would expect still that there's a really high ceiling. You know, a lot of uh, room to grow yet because I mean, he's only been you know this third year in Formula One. So I mean, there there, there there's a lot uh, that that he's got to do. A lot he's got to grow. Uh, you know, and, and the, you know, you have to think just based on that alone that the best of Lando Norris is yet to come, and, it, and it's going to be an exciting story to watch over the races and the year and years ahead, right? Yeah, and I, I guess his, I guess his artificial ceiling right now is just the dominance of Mercedes and how good Red Bull looks this year. So I, I think you know what. I think a best case scenario for him this year would be finishing in the top five in the championship. If he finished fifth in the drivers, that's fantastic because that puts him into a position next to where where presumably we're going to see greater parity and Mercedes has got a full year of running that, that Mercedes gearbox and that Mercedes power unit where, Hey, maybe next year, if there's increased parity and the regulations are imposed and there's much more commonality amongst the cars, maybe he can tussle for a championship next year. But I still think his, I think his ceiling this year is probably P5 in the driver's championship. If he does that, I think that he's done everything he could possibly do with that car. And then next year would hopefully be wide open and he could potentially chase a championship would be unbelievable to watch. Yeah. It'd be pretty exciting. and be pretty cool to watch. Uh, like you say, but you know, uh, sort of flipping gears or, or, or uh, you know, track here a little bit, his uh, former teammate, Carlos Sainz, who um, is obviously now at uh, Ferrari believes that, uh, you know, they, they can fight McLaren on pace uh, this year. I mean, uh, Carlos obviously has been uh, in, in both cars and, these years or this year's cars are basically a development on last year. Anyways, uh, Carlos said, told the official F1 uh, website, "quote It's encouraging because last year I remember that uh, the with the car McLaren I passed uh, Charles fairly easily. So I remember how big the difference between uh, McLaren and Ferrari was and how close I was to overtaking Ricardo at the end. I think I had much uh, better pace uh, than Daniel towards the end of the race. We were catching more than half a second uh, per lap." And there are positive signs. So, you know, that's an interesting take uh, from, from Carlos. But then, you know, just you, you kind of, um, you know, contrast against uh, what uh, M- Mattia Bonato says. Uh, and he says that the engine's still lacking. And then he goes on to say that, you know, that <laughs> we're still lacking in all areas. But, you know, I, I think what we saw from, from Ferrari was, uh, you know, there, there's been improvements but not improvement to the point where they're going to be back up to where we would expect them uh, to be 
and and nestled in the midst of the fight uh, between uh, Mercedes and, and Red Bull. So I, I guess that that is, uh, you know, as we talked about in the race recap, it's, it's encouraging to, uh, you know, a, a degree, but it's not where they want to be. But I, I think it is an interesting I think it's a very interesting comment that that you hear something from from Carlos. It's basically saying he's saying, "Okay, it's it, it's not bad. I was expecting it to be worse, but it was a little <laughs> bit better than I expected." So you know, there, there's that, and then you then you have a uh, you know Bonato on the other side saying, "Yeah, you know, it's it's still not uh, where we want to be. We're still lacking in all areas." You know, and, and he's, he's you know he's not just uh, you know saying about the engine the, the, the itself, right? So. It's just kind of one of these funny, you know, different stories you, you you see and different quotes that you hear from people within the same team. You know, it is funny, and I, I don't know why I haven't thought about this before, but he signed that Ferrari agreement before the beginning of last season, right? Like, he signed that agreement with a certain understanding of what Ferrari was and a certain understanding of what <laughs> McLaren was. And then in that last season, McLaren accelerates beyond, I think, the expectations of most of us, and Ferrari mm -hmm. crashes and burns. And I, I, you got to be wondering, you got to be thinking, like, what was he thinking last season and during the off season? Like, I'm going to this potential train wreck of an organization when I could have had that great Mercedes seat. Um, but ultimately, the, there's all sorts of value of, of being associated with Ferrari beyond simply the competitiveness of the car marketing mm -hmm. and exposure and blah, 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 which I think is important to a lot of drivers. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting that he signed that agreement before the 2020 season, then watch the 2020 season play out from the Mercedes car, which was improving race over race. And then he had to switch cars in the off season. So I think your point about like, hey, it's not as bad as we thought it was going to be. But then again, I, I'm also sure that Ferrari, in a reassuring way, was probably very transparent with him last year about what yeah. caused the decrease in performance last year. Like, hey, understand that this is probably, wink, wink, going to go away during the offseason and we <laughs> should be better next year. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting, too. And I mean, I think that Carlos is kind of in, uh, you know, an interesting point in his career. I mean, he, he's young enough to, that, uh, you know, he can afford to have a season that uh, where he might not be as competitive as uh, he'd want to be. And certainly, I mean, I, I think Ferrari, even before last year, were pretty upfront and saying, even before we took to the track, I think they were kind of upfront and saying, yeah, you know, 2022 is really where we're looking uh, towards being competitive again. So I, I think to a certain degree, he kind of went into the season with his, or into that deal with his eyes wide open. But you, you just have to wonder, at, you know, after those first couple of races where, you know, you saw McLaren going like this, you saw Ferrari going like that uh, through the, you know, the, the, the competitiveness scale of Formula One. You kind of have to think, you know, did, did Carlos have a couple of like, you know, wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night kind of wondering, oh, God, what did I do? But uh, it, it certainly was, I, I think it was a very impressive weekend uh, from, from McLaren as a whole. And, uh, and Ferrari better, but maybe not quite uh, what you would expect or what uh, you, you'd want to see. Uh, but still, you know, the, it, it's a long season. And, and I think as long as they're moving in the right direction, I, th I think that's a good thing. But ultimately, as, as you went back, or, or as you said right off the top of the show, we're going into a brand new Formula One in less than a year from now. And everything's going to change. And, and it, it really is the big unknown. And I mean, until we, until we get to like the, the, the first race or two or three or whatever of next year, we're going to be uh, you know, wondering who, who's got it right, uh, who got it wrong. Is it, is it going to be the, the usual suspects that are going to come out and dominate? Is it going to be maybe one of these other teams that really gets it right? I mean, it, uh, you know, it, it is all open for debate and speculation at the moment. And I, I think it's, it's a really fascinating uh, point in time to be a, a Formula One fan, just, uh, you know, where we are, where we're going to be in less than a year. Completely yeah. agree. All right. So, well, let's, uh, let's take a, uh, let's go on to the next one here. We've got a couple of nice kind of fun stories just to kind of ra wrap it up. So uh, Danny Ricardo, he's got a new uh, podium bets uh, with his, uh, you know, with uh, McLaren. Uh, you know, he, uh, he had a deal with, uh, with a surreal beatable at uh, Renault last year to get a tattoo if, uh, you know, he, he got on a podium for Renault. So he did that uh, not once, uh, but uh, he did that uh, twice. And, um, you know, the, the thing is that, okay, it's no tattoos involved, 
but uh, you know if he gets on he gets to drive one of uh you know one of uh, uh you know the collectible iconic cars that zach brown has in his heritage uh, collection so i think that would be kind of a that that's kind of a cool one you know this one i think is uh, you know it's kind of fun i think the fact that uh, he did that tattoo bet with the uh, beatable which apparently is it, as far as i know he hasn't actually lived up to and, yeah. and done it yet uh, but ricardo insists it's going to happen at some point so i don't know does that, does that mean he's going to go and income up himself but uh Anyways, I think that's uh, kind of cool. So is the bet that he gets one of Zach Brown's personal cars or he gets a car out of the McLaren collection? Well, that, that's why I was a little bit unclear of. I thought I thought it was he got to take one out of, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's a personal one or it's the... Uh, or uh, Zach's own personal collection, but regardless, it's it's kind of cool, you know. It's uh, it, it, it's pretty neat. Uh, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I would feel bad taking a car to the MCL collection. I think they belong there, but I would want to take a car off of Zach Brown. Like, give me the cars to your garage and let me pick a car. Like, I I would be juiced up to uh to get one of his personal cars. Yeah, actually, no, I, I'm going through my notes here. It's actually through uh, Zach's, uh, you know, personal uh, collection. So apparently, oh, nice. you know, yeah, so apparently this is something they were kind of like uh, joking about. And, uh, you know, uh, th this is uh, actually going to become a, come a thing. I mean, if, if you've got like an awesome car collection like that, you're you're lucky enough to have one. You know, uh, you know I, I'd be, you know, Zach, if you're listening, I, I, I'm willing to make that bet. Well, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to get a podium on, on this year, but uh, Maybe we come to a, an agreement that so maybe we can get a ride uh, driving one of Zach's uh, personal totally. cars. I, I, Hot tip, by the way, Google Zach Brown car collection. He's got a fire car collection. He's got some great, great cars. Well, now, you know, I, I've really got to go and, uh, you know, check that out. Uh, you, <laughs> I'll do that after the show. Uh, anyways, um, oh, this is one I wanted to, you know, maybe a little bit out of place, uh, but uh, Ross uh, Braun was, uh, he was uh, really full of praise of uh, Yuki Sonoda, the uh, the Alpha Tauri uh, rookie, calling him one of the best rookies in Formula One in years. And uh, you know, that was one of those uh, performances. I mean, he he looked good all race long. He um, he was really getting stuck in there and, uh, you know, ended up uh, scoring a P10. He actually said that uh, if he hadn't attacked uh, Lance Stroll at the end of the race, uh, he wouldn't have uh, slept that night, I guess, uh, out of guilt or, you know, conscience or something. But I really liked what I saw from uh, Sunoda. I, I thought that, uh, you know, even though he's only 20 years old, I, I thought he looked very, very mature for, for a young driver. And I, I think that he's going to be an exciting one to watch. Uh, you know, I mean, Alpha Tauri, I mean, not exactly a front runner. I mean, although Gasly, I think, uh, qualified uh, quite well, uh, you know, for, for this race. But uh, Sunoda, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a really exciting thing. I mean, uh, Ross Braun had to say, quote, I'm really impressed with Yuki Sonoda. I met him at the weekend for the first time, and he's really an impressive character. He's quite amusing, and his language in the car can be quite a bit fruity. He showed some brilliant spells in the race, which is encouraging, considering it was his first F1 race. He's the best F1 rookie F1 has had in years, having been fairly stunning in whatever series he's competed in. His promotion by Red Bull looks like a brilliant move, end quote. So, I mean, coming from the mouth of uh, Ross Braun, that is high praise indeed. And finally, last but not least, uh, we all know that, uh, that Fernando Alonso retired because of uh, brake issues at uh, the Bahrain Grand Prix. Apparently, it was uh, caused by a sandwich wrapper getting sucked up into his uh, brake duct, <laughs> you know, which is seems like the most unformula one way to retire from a Grand Prix, if you ask me. So, anyways, that's it, Mark. That that's all I've got uh, for for tonight. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm going to I'm going to leave it right there because you know I, I think uh, as you were talking, I googled uh, Zach Brown's uh, car collection and the the the, uh, the, the, uh, the the article I found includes jaw dropping in the in the title. So now I can see why uh, Danny Ricardo wants to make that bet and get behind one of the wheels of uh, those uh, bad boys. So <laughs> there you go. I mean, looking at it here, he's got a, a Nigel Mansell's FW11B. One of That's one of my favorite cars because that's about the time when I was a kid, I came into uh, watching, uh, you know, Formula One. He's got Ayrton Senna's go-karts. I mean, yeah, talk about some, uh, you know, very, very cool cars. I mean, uh, yeah. I'd love to make a, that bet with uh, Zach, but uh, sadly, I don't think it's going to happen. But one thing that is going to happen, guys, is sadly that this show is coming to an end. Not forever, but uh, for, for this week. And uh, we're going to leave it there. I have, hope you all have a, a nice uh, long Easter weekend. Uh, get out and enjoy, hopefully, some nice weather wherever you're at. And if you want to get in touch, by, also, uh, by all means do so. You can send us an e email at scuderiaf1pod at gmail.com or on Twitter at scuderiaf1pod. 
And if you want to support the show, the easiest and most convenient and uh, moneyless way to do so, I mean, if you want to send us money, I'm sure we can accommodate you, but that's absolutely not necessary. But if you want to support us, the easiest way is to go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your uh, podcast from and leave a five-star rating and review for your favorite show. And once you're done doing that for them, come on over, give us a nice rating and review too. I'm mean, self-defeatist attitude here. It's terrible. But anyways do that nonetheless we'd uh, we'd appreciate it and that's it that's a wrap we're out of here and we'll talk to you guys again very very soon bye for now <laughs>